Hey everyone, what's up? It is Corey Akers here from CrossFit Rampage. This is a video just for the community, for any CrossFit affiliate owners looking to host a competition. So uh, we've been around for going on six years. We've hosted nine competitions. I've learned a lot from every one of them. They've gotten better and better and better um, as far as the prep going into it, the organization, the day of, the feedback, uh, and this this video stems from we just had our third years in a row scaled competition this past weekend here at CrossFit Rampage and I've heard nothing but stellar reviews about it. So anyways, this video isn't about that competition. It's about having done this for so many years and seeing so many competitions pop up. I just want to put out a list of things that we do that I've learned in the past that maybe you're taking the time to watch this and just one of these numerous things I'm gonna say help you out because you'd like to host a competition. Whether it be a CrossFit competition, a weightlifting meet, a in-house thing, um, a benefit workout, fundraiser, whatever. So um, guys, I just started jotting stuff down on this little notebook. I've got about three or four pages in. So this isn't gonna be grouped together. It's not gonna be super organized. Uh, I'm just gonna run through a bunch of stuff that we've been doing we've kind of uh started to accumulate doing these things over the years and by no means have we always done all of this and there's still plenty of room to improve and a lot of things that i'll probably miss that maybe some other people can chime in and help me out with um all right so you want to have an event before the event starts you need to be thinking of this numerous months out like in my opinion, if I'm two months out and I haven't done much, I'm stressed. So, I mean, if you can be three months out with potentially six months out already having the idea of, hey, I'm going to do it, I need to start thinking about it. So, the further out, the better. And then the further out, you can start putting dates out there because there's so much going on in people's lives, the better. So, there's no hard set rules. Six months out, be thinking about it. Three months out, you know, at least think about getting registration up, um, of which we've failed at terribly in the past, things have still worked out. But if you've got people on top of it, this is just going to help everything go smoother. So before the event, you need to create a Facebook event page. That's going to help out. People are on their phones. They're on Facebook all the time. They'll get notifications. Having a website for your event is great and it's very professional and, and you it's a central location for everything, but also having a Facebook event page because notifications pop up and you can start threads where people are asking questions and posting and stuff. That stuff doesn't happen on the website. So a Facebook event page is a must. Also, an Instagram page. The Instagram page isn't necessarily as detail oriented. It's more just to create some awareness, some hype, a little bit of talk about it, um, posting pictures, posting workout releases, stuff like that. So Facebook event page, Instagram page, and then potentially a website. We've done with and without websites and done fine both ways. That's just up to you if you have the means to keep track of all those. Um, who's going to handle your registration? If you're going to do it yourself, then you need to be on your computer, on your phone, on your email all the time. You need to understand PayPal, everything about Google Sheets, sharing, getting money, charging people, stuff like that. Um, I know throwdowns.com handles registration here in the local ten middle Tennessee area. And obviously if they're online, they can do it anywhere. Um, but I don't know where you're at. So throwdowns.com can do it or I've done registration myself every year. It could be a hassle. Um, depending on how on top of it you stay and if you've got early registration or late registration is there a cap is there not a cap do you have multiple divisions do you have different prices so um, start thinking about registration ask a lot of questions from people who have had competitions uh, who's going to do your scoring think about that ahead of time our very first year we or first two years we had someone in-house do it but now going back to throwdowns.com they handle scoring and it's great it's day of, they you know they show you how to use it and it's all live online. So throwdowns.com for scoring and registration. Um, and I'm not sponsored by them by any means. Uh, we were one of their first competitions that they kind of trial ran years ago. I think it's been four years. Um, and they've just made leaps and bounds of progress since then. Um, are you gonna have a cap on athletes? I would highly, highly suggest setting a cap. And then as time goes on, if you decide, okay, 
we've got the workout set, we've got the timeline set, we've got the space set up, we can have more. Then add more. You don't want to allow too many on the front end and then go back and have to change workouts and cut off minutes and time here and there and then start earlier and earlier in the day. So set a cap first and then increase that if needed. We've made that mistake in the past. Um, let's see. Create a timeline first of possible workouts. So say, for example, I've got four workouts. I've got, I'll just use this past weekend. I've got an eight minute workout, a nine minute workout, a 14 minute workout, and a three minute workout. Now some of those are for time, but that's the cap and that's how long the clock's gonna run. So set that up and then how many athletes do I want to have? How many athletes can I run per heat? And something that you're gonna do yourself a huge favor by doing is make sure you can allow the same number of athletes in every heat. So if maybe one workout I can squeeze 10, but another workout I can only have six, that's gonna mess up the heat list and the timelines all day. So figure that out first. I've got my possible workouts I want. Now, how many athletes can I have at the minimum on the smallest workout or the smallest amount of people per workout? And then just copy that to the rest of them. Say, all right, we can only have six per heat. Now you can draw up your entire day's timeline from we're starting at 8 a.m., we've got this many heats, this many divisions, then we'll finish at whatever time. So definitely draw up a timeline. Here's something I've seen people go wrong about and I feel like we've started to do a lot better job at this. Put a decent amount of transition time in between same gender heat, so women's heat one, women's heat two. I like to put five minutes in between heats, okay? I know that seems like a lot of time, but it's gonna help you out at the end of the day. And then in between divisions, but it's the same workout, so the same judges can stay out there, the same equipment besides you know male, female adjusted stuff. Um, between same workout, but different divisions, I put 10 minutes. Then whenever a brand new workout is gonna start and all the equipment has to be changed, things have to be moved around, I put 15 minutes. Again, that might seem like a little much, but the more padding, the better. That's gonna help you stay on time better. You don't wanna be way behind at the end of this thing and everyone's like, oh, I'm ready to go home because you thought that everything was gonna run perfect and that you were gonna get done like in an absurd amount of time that's not really gonna happen. All right, um, another thing, guys. Speaking from experience, because we just wrapped up an event, I've spent so much time in the past month on Google Drive. No Google Drive, no Google Documents, Google Sheets. It's easy, it's, it's like Excel, but since it's online, you can easily share it between folks. You can send it to the public, you can send it to individuals that have a Gmail account. Um, you can print from it, you can do everything. So if you're not one that knows that stuff, I probably wouldn't advise trying to learn it. I would get a left-hand man that's just as involved in setting up the competition as you are and have them do it, okay? But this needs to be someone that's not slacking and not someone who you have to remind them about it. Rather, they're checking their phone at 10 at night seeing that a new athlete got signed up and they need to double check that everything's in there right, okay? Not, oh, well, I didn't look at it yet this week and it's Thursday, okay? This needs to be someone who's on top of it all the time and they need to know how to use Google Sheets. That's just like Excel because you're gonna do a lot of creating of stuff in there. Um, also, something I've not done yet, but I'm gonna do next year. Create a new email account specifically for everything pertaining to the event. So I'll use the event we just had, the Rampage Scaled Comp. Next year, I'm gonna have an email, rampagescaledcomp at gmail.com. Everything I put out is gonna have that email on it. So then I don't have to sift through my personal email account my business account and find all of the emails that came in about the competition. Because people are gonna be sending you emails, they're gonna be sending you texts, they're gonna be sending you Facebook messages, Instagram messages. So the least number of places you have to check for questions, information, the better. And then the competition is gonna sell out and you're gonna have people asking about a waiting list and then you're gonna try to figure out like, oh, well who asked me first and in what order, who do I let in first, but this person sent me a message on Facebook, this person emailed this account, this person did this, so um, the less things to check the better, and I might even put on there, hey, don't Facebook message me or don't Instagram message me, send everything to this email or whatever, something so it's all kind of consolidated. 
All right. Um, you're likely going to want to have some sort of sponsors at your event. It's fun for the spectators. It's fun for the athletes. It's great for the sponsors, for the community, um, whether that be gear, clothing, food, supplements, um, other stuff, whatever. Okay. There's a lot of options out there. Uh, here in Middle Tennessee, a couple that are just a go-to for me are, um, aside from using throwdowns.com as a service provider, um, they're still a sponsor, but on site, you want some food. Okay. Food is a must. Definitely something people can get lunch with. Spectators are going to be here all day. They want some lunch. Um, paleo works. Contact Paleo Works. Um, and then also gear. Guys, well, let's say clothing, not necessarily gear. There's a lot of gear, jump ropes and knee sleeves and this and that, and a lot of stuff you can get. But let's talk clothing. Um, Barbell Voodoo, they're local here in Middle Tennessee. They're always great. Great setup. Roy is great. Um, he's the guy that's going to come out and set everything up. Everyone loves their clothing. The girls really, really love the clothing. Um, I'm not sponsored by them, but they've been at almost every one of our events. So both Barbell Voodoo and Pele Works. Um, and then, guys, there's a ton of companies out there. Chiropractic, uh, Massage Therapist, um, whatever. There's, there's a lot of places that you might can get to come out, and they're going to pay you to be there, which is good, and then you know they're going to get something in return. They're going to get new business. They're going to get um, exposure to a lot of people all at once that are very interested in the same kind of field that they're in. So contact sponsors as soon as you can okay not the week of um sorry uh so not the week of not two weeks before try to get a hold of these guys that six months out when you start thinking about it or at least three months because they've got stuff going on too and likely your events on a weekend and that's when people are doing events so you don't want them to already be booked um something that we just recently did and it was a huge help and i can't thank our members enough one weekend before the event, we had a gym cleaning day. We said, hey, 9.30, everyone that is interested in just lending a helping hand to clean, feel free to show up. We'll have the cleaning supplies. You just show up. Clean the gym inside and out, parking lot, bathrooms, walls, windows, everything. Get it cleaned up. It's, it's a good time to do that because you can also kind of use the reasoning of, hey, we're about to have one, two three multiple hundred people in our gym next weekend don't you guys want it to look good so your members will likely help you out with that um let's see day of have on hand more toilet paper more paper towels than you think you're going to need when you think you've got enough go out and buy another 48 count roll of toilet paper and another 18 pack of paper towels also have some extra soap also have extra trash bags have made that mistake before um three to four large trash cans not like a kitchen trash can but like the one the big ones with the lid that you set out by the roadside if you don't at least have three of those rent some get some or have a ton of trash cans placed throughout even if it's just the big construction barrel type kind um and have trash cans with bags don't think that that trash can is not going to get filled up because it is so i have those big black contractor grade bags in the trash can so that you can actually remove it throughout the day also have some people assigned to taking the trash out taking the trash out in the bathrooms in locker rooms if you have them out on the competition floor everywhere that the trash cans are someone's specific job should be hang out watch the competition have a good time but every 30 minutes, you need to do a lap around and see about refilling trash cans. Um, guys, for the judges, have a ton of clipboards. Have your score sheets, of which you should have made on Google Sheets. Okay, Have a bunch of ink pens. Extra. Don't have exactly the number of judges that you have. If you have 10 judges, have 20 pens. If you have 10 judges, have 15 clipboards. Okay. Um, when asking for volunteers, judges, volunteers... Guys, just call them judges. You're going to find a lot of people want to volunteer and they're scared to judge. You'll end up with 30 volunteers and six judges. Say, hey, we're looking for judges and we might use you for something else the day of. Okay, That's how it's worked best in my opinion in the past. Now, aside from just asking for judges, you're going to want to ask for some specific jobs for the day of. I'll go through a couple of these that I've kind of learned over the years past that have helped things run really, really smooth. So these people might already be in mind like, hey, I think this person is going to be good for this job. They're a member of your gym or a friend or something. Ask that person directly. Tell them what you need. 
you might be surprised that they'll be like, yeah, sure, what time do I show, do I show up? Okay. Um, or some jobs that it doesn't really have to be a specific personality type, post on your gym's Facebook page, say, hey, I need help with this. So something, for example, that I did, I said, hey, I need someone to direct parking from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. Didn't matter who. Someone within 10 minutes responded, said, hey, I'll be there. What time do I show up? I got them a little orange or yellow construction vest. So they stood out there in the parking lot and told people where to go. Okay, that's a specific job. Um, other specific jobs, day of. You're going to want a head judge. It's going to be the head judge's responsibility weeks before to be lining up the judges, to getting all those people's names and contact information and t-shirt sizes. Don't forget to have a form on Google Forms to get the judges t-shirt sizes, okay? That's something you don't want to deal with late. Um, so head judge deals with the heat time assignments for when all the judges are supposed to go, who's in the morning, who's in the midday, who's in the afternoon. The head judge on the day of is keeping those people in line and is also scanning the competition floor during every single workout to make sure that all the judges are doing what they're supposed to. Judges aren't standing behind someone or they're not, you know, helping a athlete move equipment when they're not supposed to and that they are calling out no reps. So the judge is in there overseeing the whole thing, each workout, making sure that goes well. The head judge may also do this next job or you may have a separate person. We've had a separate person and it works out great. The athlete briefer. So say 10 minutes before every workout, the next heat of individuals are to arrive in a specific location at the facility. The head athlete briefer will then go over a quick few reminders, highlights of things they need to know. Which way to face, where to set your jump rope down, where do you start, when or when do you finish, all of these things. So just quick reminders so the athletes feel completely uh, comfortable with what's about to happen. So. Having that person out there before every workout is very, very helpful. We just started doing that about two years ago, changed everything. There were a lot less questions. The athletes went out there, they did what they were supposed to, got in, got done with each workout. Um, let's see. Guys, try to have a team meeting with all these people like five to six weeks out. So then they're on board, they know, hey, we, this next month, month and a half is go time. A lot of things in the gym unfortunately get kind of put to the side because everyone's focused on this, but it's great to have everyone's effort and mind focused in the same spot. So this is where you already want to have your 20, 30, 40 judges, your specific job assignments, um, all of those things. Now, some of them you might not have in line yet, but the more, the sooner, the better. So then you can have a team meeting, just a quick like 30, 45 minutes on a Friday afternoon, a month and a half out, so everyone can kind of get on the same page. All right, um, you're gonna want a PA system for someone commentating, announcing heat times, even having fun on the microphone, just keeping everything lively. Um, and that person is gonna want a wireless mic, so headset, microphone. We, for a few years, had a wired mic, and you're limited with space, and it, it was just bad. Um, you're gonna want music playing. Maybe it's on the same PA system, or maybe it's a separate system. Just the way our gym is set up, we've had a separate music system which works out great because you can just leave the music at one level and anytime you adjust volume, you can adjust the PA or the music. I know you can still do that on some PA systems, but that's just the way ours set up and it worked out great. So music, PA system, someone that's gonna be on the microphone all day long. All right, um, know where you can park. Now, unfortunately, more people are gonna show up than your facility was designed to host. So. Go ahead to the neighboring businesses, ask them, hey, on this day, can overflow parking people for our event park here? If not, go ahead and make a map of that and write, no, no one parking here. Send out emails to that. Put that on your Facebook page. Put that on your Instagram page. Find out where people can and can't park. Have someone to direct them. Um, guys, with all your athlete registration money, you're gonna be able to afford the shirts and a handful of other things you're gonna need to rent or go get. Here's a general rule of thumb as far as giving out free water. Take the number of athletes that you have competing and multiply that number by six and go buy that much free water or more. And then have a couple coolers. If you've got a fridge on site, fill that fridge's freezer up with bags of ice 
So you have free water all day for the athletes and the judges. Uh, and it's up to you whether you want the spectators or not to have free water. Um, I might go with no on that, but if you do, then you might multiply the number of athletes by eight instead of six. Um, we already talked about having a food vendor out there. Um, even other drinks. If there's any other drink, hang on. If there's any other drink company, local company, um, smoothie or like we had greater than the coconut water rehydration uh, drink we had them supply a bunch of drinks for the competition so uh, any other drinks aside from water that you can give out as in like you paid for them but then you're giving them out then that's uh, a big benefit to the competitors um, find out where you're gonna get equipment if anyone calls me and I've got a good standing relationship with you I'm going to give you all the equipment you need for my gym on that day. So neighboring gyms, uh, friends, garage gym owners, whatever. Because you might not have enough bumper plates for 10 guys to all go for max clean and jerk, right? If you do, awesome, great. Then that's one less thing you got to think about. But if you do need equipment, where are you getting it from? When can you pick it up? When do you have to drop it off? And who's going to pick it up? If you don't have a truck or a trailer, you need to line that stuff up. And then the person that has it, are they available or are you going to drive it? Can you drive the truck and trailer? Things to think about. Um, next thing, uh, how are you going to brief the judges? You don't want to wait till the day of and try to get all your judges on board with what the workouts are, what you're looking for. Make videos, get yourself in front of a camera like this, say exactly what you want the judges to know and do the day of, send that to them, tell them to watch it. And then also have one or multiple judges meetings in the week or weeks leading up to the event. If you can have face-to-face -face conversation and Q&A, that's going to help out with the judges so much more on the day of being comfortable with what they're doing. All right, uh, changing gears. The workout layout in your gym. Something I started doing a few years ago, and this is excellent, draw up on whether it's some sort of... Uh, program on your computer or if you just use the outline tool on Google Sheets, draw up a blueprint of the inside of your gym looking down. As in, here's my pull-up rack, here's the shape of the walls, here's this little thing sticking out that takes up room, whatever it might be. Okay. Then once you have that, make a bunch of copies of it. Then from there, with a pencil that you can erase, draw on it where all the lanes are going to be, where are the athletes, where they set their barbells, where they set their rowers. and then. Set that stuff up in the gym as well and see if it works. Likely, it's not going to be perfect the first time. You're going to have to move stuff. You're going to want to measure your lanes. You're going to want to put blue tape on the floor, painter's tape, because it comes up easy, to make sure all these lanes are equally uh, adjusted, width-wise, length-wise, all that. So now I've got these blueprints drawn up. I can show these to someone. This is another specific job title. I can show these blueprints to the person who the day of is going to be in charge of moving every workout as in workout one is done all this equipment needs to get out of here this equipment needs to be adjusted and put in these places so that person can have the blueprint and they know exactly where it should go so that's going to be really really helpful having a blueprint of where everything should go so the day of there's no like oh crap we don't have enough room for this many rowers we just assumed we would okay so blueprint your building um warm up space guys there's nothing worse than being a competitor at a competition and not being able to warm up adequately okay now i know you're not going to be able to have everything that someone needs but what you should have are a handful of men's bars a handful of women's bars a lot of bumper plates don't just put 15s 25s and 45s out there throw some fives and tens out there as well have some bands, some kettlebells, some PVC pipes, something padded so people can foam roll, put their knees on the ground, stuff like that. If you don't have space or the weather's bad or something, rent a tent. We've done that in years past. Rent a tent, put people under it, okay? Your athletes are going to want somewhere to warm up and 17 guys aren't going to want to share the same barbell warming up because it always happens, never fails. You walk up to warm up, and there's already a group of guys over there that are at like 90% and you just want an empty bar and maybe a pair of 25s to put on it. So have multiple bars, plenty of warm-up equipment, and then where are you going to get that equipment from? Maybe you have leftover just like beater stuff that's over in the corner. That's fine, but is it enough? Should you ask volunteers if they can bring stuff? Should you ask other gyms? Um, 
I had a guy, fortunately, with our fast competition, he reached out to me and he said, hey, I've got a whole gym that we just started full of equipment. You want me to bring any? That was a heaven sent. He brought a bunch of stuff. So make sure you have a warm-up area. Uh, bathrooms. Okay, guys, we've only got two bathrooms at our gym and it works out, but man, it's tough. There's a line for the bathroom all day. So rent some porta potties, put them away from somewhere where you're not going to smell them. Uh, probably get like two or three. All right. Um, t shirts. Your registration or your athlete registration money is going back towards the t shirts because you're going to have to pay for a bunch of t shirts for judges who they didn't have to pay to be here. So you're having to fork over money from the athletes to pay for the judges t-shirts. That's just how it goes. So you might not want to off or you might not want an unlimited number of judges. You might say, hey, first 30 judges get a t-shirt or however many you're working with. Um, t-shirts, we've had Barbell Voodoo do our shirts in the past. I know there's some other local companies, Print Fit, 7.5. A lot of companies around Middle Tennessee doing t-shirts, um, but get a design, really cool yet simple design without a whole bunch of stuff going on that people are going to want to wear out in public. They're going to want to wear their gym training in it. Um, make it look good. Get all your sponsors to email their logos. Put these sponsor logos on the back of the shirts. Uh, and then the shirts for the judges, you might have as a different color or at least a different style somehow. Maybe on the back it says something different so that they can differentiate the athletes and the judges. Um, Guys, all your money coming in from registration, if it's sitting in a different bank account or a PayPal account and it's going to take a couple days to transfer out, don't wait until the day before the event to transfer money that you might need. So as money's coming in, transfer it to a usable bank account. If you're withdrawing cash for the prizes the day of, make sure you get that out ahead of time. I've messed up with that before. I'm like, oh, we've got plenty of money. I'll just withdraw all the money that we're giving to first, second, third place and be good. Forgot to do it day of I don't have any cash on hand so make sure you withdraw money ahead of time what are you gonna do for prizes for the winners that's up to you common things are local supplement companies give out supplements um, clothing companies give out clothing that's kinda hard because you might not know what size ahead of time the winners are gonna be uh, I always like to take a decent amount of the registration money and put it back towards the prize winners I'd like for second place at least to win the registration back and then first place gets a registration plus some. Or if you've got a lot of money to play with, then you might even say last or third place, sorry, gets the registration plus some back. So that's completely up to you as the event organizer. Uh, are you going to do trophies, medals? If you're getting special trophies engraved with your competition's name on it, you're going to have to do that like a week or two ahead of time because those don't happen overnight. Um, and then medals. At worst case scenario, first, second, third place medals, so you can give the person something when they get their picture taken. Um, heat, list, and times. Once an athlete registers, they immediately want to know what time do I go? When's the first event? How long is the day going to last? How much time between events? Do I have time to warm up? Do I have time to eat lunch? Should I only eat a snack? Yada, yada. So you're going to want to make sure you get the heat list and times to the athletes as soon as you can. Now, it usually happens because of late registration, people. This only comes out a couple days, but when you do send it out, make sure it's accurate. I usually end up having a typo or something wrong on there. Um, so proofread it, proofread it, proofread it. Do your best. Um, and we found that if, if we made it color coordinated, then it was perfect. If I'm heat one and I'm pink, and this is the heat's time, I just look for pink, and it's easy. Okay, so um, heat list and times make it easy to decipher. You're going to want to do that probably on Google Sheets. If you're not good with it, have someone do it that's just as involved as you are. Uh, you're going to want to make a similar heat times list for the judges so the judges know when to go. You don't just want 30 judges standing there and you just kind of trying to say, oh, can you guys judge? All right, cool, hop into this heat. You're going to want them to have their name on a different heat list and they see, okay, it's 1015, I judge the heat at 1015. Okay, it's 1135, I'm off at 1135. So that's something else to know. That was the last thing I wrote. Guys, we are about 30 minutes into this thing. I doubt you've watched this far, but if you have, thank you. Hopefully something in here helps you out. All right, appreciate it.